host, Dennis Horvitz, the David Letterman of the Hopelessly Damned, Dr. J. Anderson Thompson, Jr., uh, Andy, Correct. Right? Uh, as you like to be called, and uh, he is a clinical psychiatrist, and in addition to being uh, having a private practice, he uh, is affiliated with the University of Virginia, which I think you said was Thomas Jefferson's University. Mr. Jefferson's University. Mr. Jefferson's University. He's affiliated with the University of Virginia Student Health Services. And you're also into uh, forensic psychiatry. Uh, maybe at the end of the show, if I, uh, we have time, we can fill us in a little bit about that. Uh, Andy gave a, uh, gave a talk today uh, entitled, Why Do We Believe in Gods? The evolved psychology of the supernatural uh, beliefs. I'm sorry. Let me let me write. Let me say that again. Um, why do we believe in gods? The evolved psychology of supernatural beliefs. That's what it is. Um, why do we believe in gods? There are a number of reasons, and I think uh, a way to understand this is that we're in the middle of a cognitive neuroscience revolution that is showing us how people's minds generate religious beliefs, how they generate specific religious beliefs, and why human minds are vulnerable to accept those beliefs. And a way to think about it is that religious beliefs are a byproduct, a byproduct of mechanisms that evolved a long time ago to solve other problems. And there are a number of of mechanisms that come together to create the cultural byproduct of religious beliefs. This is probably a new idea for people in the audience. A way of understanding it is uh, to think about a McDonald's Big Mac meal. <laughs> if you understand the psychology of the Big Mac meal, you start to understand the psychology of religion. I think all of us, if we admit it, we like Big Macs, right. Big Mac meals. And it's because we have evolved adaptations uh, for things that were crucial for our survival. Sweets, the sweets of sugar, uh, but the sugar in fruit. Uh, for fats, but the fat of lean game meat. Uh, for salt, these things were crucial for survival. We don't have cravings for broccoli because tubers were uh, plentiful and, and formed a staple probably of prehistoric diets. We have these mechanisms that we have these cravings, and in the modern world, things are created which come from those cravings, but hijack them in super supernatural form, in a, in, a, in a super normal stimulus. And that is the way you want to think about religion. Religion is a cultural byproduct, and it creates supernatural stimulation of these ancient adaptations. And, and just to give you one example, we have uh, the attachment system. This is the basic caretaking system, uh, crucial to all mammals. All, uh, and when we're in distress, we turn to an attachment figure, uh, an attachment person. Originally, obviously, it was our mother or mother substitutes. That attachment system is something that religions utilize. If you're in distress, you turn to uh, a super attachment figure, a god, who is going to take care of you. So that's one of the mechanisms. And as you see, God or gods are a supernormal, a supernatural uh, stimulus to that attachment system. And that's just the attachment system is just one of a myriad number of cognitive adaptations that evolved earlier for other purposes which come together to create religious ideas, I, religious I think, beliefs. I think, it's, I think it's kind of ironic that, for instance, uh, the uh, the emotional mechanism that makes people reject the idea of evolution is in fact a product of evolution. It's the result of uh, of our uh, you know the development of our minds. The, you know the denial, the whole emotional system that makes people go into denial like that. Um, I, actually, you know, I had not thought of that, and I think that's an excellent observation that our minds are designed uh, uh, to to think of of things. Uh, as purposeful. If you look at young children and you ask them what a rock is for, they say it's for animals to scratch themselves. Right. Uh, what are rivers for? For boats to float on. That our minds are designed to look for purpose. And we see it particularly starkly in, in children. And, and that has adaptive advantage, obviously. Yes. has adaptive advantage. 
but uh, it's one of the things that makes us uh, vulnerable to look for purpose in gods and in religion and makes it very hard for us, which I think is, is an excellent observation, it makes it very hard for us to really understand natural selection and it's a random process with no purpose or no design. Right. Well, people, I think one of the definitions of intelligence is the ability to recognize patterns. Right. And there's, in, so we're, I think as a, as, a, as, as a species, I think we're very susceptible to the, um, uh, what's the fallacy, the um, post hoc ergo propter hoc. Yes. Yeah we, yeah, we recognize patterns and causes when they when they don't exist. Because when we were running around on on the African savanna chasing down antelopes, uh, that's the way reality was for us. That's the way we evolved to perceive reality. Well, we, it's important that yeah. we over recognize patterns, particularly yes. patterns of agency and particularly patterns of dangerous agency. Uh, you don't want to ever uh, mistake a burglar for a shadow, and right. so. We, our minds are designed right. to, to over, over read patterns and particularly to over read agency. Right. And, 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 and someone who, and, and any animal who uh, uh, mistakes a rustle, a, a rustle in the brushes for a predator uh, has a better chance of surviving, yeah. of, of being wrong and surviving. Yeah. Like it's better to be wrong and there be nothing there. Yeah, well, that to be wrong and there'd be something there. You know. Yeah, I, I think a way for people to think about it is to think about the smoke detectors in your house. Yeah. Those smoke detectors are set so that they'll go off with boiling water. Right. Okay. And it, they'll go off with boiling water because a false positive going off with bo boiling water is inconvenient. A false negative um, not going off when there's a fire and your house burns down. Right. So a way to think about this is that natural selection has shaped our brain. Yes not to minimize errors, the number of errors, but to minimize the cost of errors. That's it right. does no good to shape a brain that escapes a predator eight out of ten times. You have to shape a brain that escapes that predator ten out of ten times. That's so right. we, have, we have what uh, a man named Justin Barrett has called hyperactive agency detection mechanisms. And you know, the, these mechanisms are, are one of the other mechanisms that go into uh, making us both uh, generate religious beliefs, but be susceptible to them. Uh, to, to we'll overread agency, and so we're primed to say overread. Um, and and we do it. We do it. Uh, think about how you do it in your everyday life, just in humorous ways. When it rains outside, I say, "Oh, it's raining today because I didn't bring my umbrella." Right. And we joke about that. Right. But underneath that joke, it shows that right. sense is, of agency. There is that sense. Well, anybody anybody who owns a computer probably has a sense of agency. Yes. When you get furious at it, and you want to yeah. throw it out the window. As if it's an intentional. Is it? Agent. Yeah. Your car won't start, and you blame the car, yeah. and, that, yeah. and that kind of thing. Um, and, and and if I can put in one, there's yeah. one nice example I, I thought of that. If if you look, there's a interview of Richard Dawkins evolutionary biologist and Randy Nessie, a famous evolutionary physician. And, and it's an interview and they're talking to each other about natural selection and they both catch each other because they keep, they're aware that they keep talking about natural selection as having a purpose or an intention. And yes. so even there in, in two scientists, you, you can see that ancient piece of thinking. And, and even in atheists, if, if you talk to me, I will probably say, well, there was some particular traumatic piece of my past that was good it happened because it, it caused yeah, yeah. Something, you know, something else to happen. And, and we're just very vulnerable to think in terms of agency and causation where it doesn't exist. That's funny because uh, I have been, I've noticed that I, um, I, I tend to watch programs uh, such as on the National Geographic Channel that deal with evolution. Mm -hmm. And even, even you know, these television shows that essentially get it right, there is still, and I think in some cases it's, un it's unconscious, but there's this, there is this tendency, even by proponents, to address evolution as though it's purposeful. Yes, I mean, and, uh, and it shows that, that that's the way we're, our, our minds yeah, are hardwired. Uh, we, I, I, and I don't know, what the, I don't know what, what the solution is. I don't know what we need a new, way, new language, a new... Uh, you know, I don't know. No, what it's it is. just it's education. It's education, education, education. Well, you know, it, one of the thing, one of my complaints is that there have been a series of these show, of shows. I think it was on either the Discovery Channel. I think it was on the Discovery Channel or the Science Channel. And it's a these usually these two-hour specials dealing with uh, dinosaurs. 
and the graphics are great, and I'm sure the information is great. But my objection is that they tend to portray the actions of these dinosaurs as though they were aware of the consequences of their actions in some kind of larger sense. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Tyrannosaurus mother puts her eggs in one spot and guards them be, so that the next generation will do this, that, and the other thing, or, you know. And clearly, that wouldn't have been the case. They, they, they did what they did out of pure instinct. Mm -hmm. They didn't know why they were doing it. The dinosaur didn't have some mental image of baby dinosaurs running around and playing, you know. Right. And, but it, it, it's hard to avoid falling into that trap, mm -hmm. you know. Um, no, and, and, and young, you can catch it in young children. Young yeah. children will, will, will see animals as, as, have having, as having minds. Right. Um, and uh, there's a famous experiment uh, by a researcher in Ireland, and she has a puppet show, and um, a, 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 I think an alligator eats a mouse. And then they ask the children, uh, well, does a mouse need to eat? And the children, these are preschool children, the children say no. Right. And then they ask the children, does the mouse uh, think and know certain things? And the children say yes. And so you can see in children, you know, that there's a sense of a mind um, separate from a body, you know, the idea of a mind and intentions and goals separate from a body, uh, we're born with. Uh, and they'll, they'll, they'll speak of animals, even. And I think all of us, if we, you know, we're, if we admit it, we're a little bit vulnerable to the same thinking. It persists into adulthood. Sure, and, and I think a lot of people, not, not, even, not even in the religious sense, but there's just a lot of things, the way they sell products on television, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, it, it, all they have to do is inject the, the slightest bit of plausibility into it, you know, and there's that tendency to think that one thing follows and therefore follows yeah. another. Right. And uh, I think a lot of people get conned. I, but, but you're right. I mean, all of us are susceptible. Yeah, we, no, we, matter how, no matter how rational a person you are or how committed you are to logical thinking, uh, we, there just simply isn't enough time in the day to, 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 to parse every situation, you know, well, and, and, and think it through, you know. Well, and, and, and I think one of the other things that is crucial to understanding religion and, and the point that you just made is that in our modern skulls is a Stone Age brain. Right. Our, our brain was designed to survive on the savannas of Africa in small groups, yeah. small hunter-gatherer groups. So this overdeveloped sense of purpose and causation had survival advantages. The, these kind of things would not be instantiated in our brain unless they were crucial for survival on the plains of Africa during our evolutionary history. Now, they don't particularly, at times, work very well in the modern world, as you point out, and they can be taken advantage of by advertisers. But again, it, it's also something that uh, sets us up uh, to generate uh, religious beliefs and, and to get pulled into them. Right. Well, you know, we, we actually just... Uh uh, just prior to uh, your coming, and we we uh, interviewed Nate Phelps, who was the, yeah, uh, the son of the son of, uh, of uh, the Reverend Fred God hates fags Phelps, and mm -hmm. and uh, he was kind of, you know, his uh, his story, unlike not unlike many other similar tragic stories, kind of illustrates that how your brain is. Uh, uh, is geared in a certain way. I think the fact that people, you know, accept victimhood under certain circumstances is because when some, you have this certain kind of tendency to believe in a certain way anyway, just because of the neurological construction of the brain. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're you're brought into a situation where, where what where what to what any reasonable person would be an atrocious lifestyle or a completely absurd way of looking at things. In their minds, one thing follows another, you know, and when you're told that there's a God who is going to punish you for not doing what he wants, and that's your only form of reference, you know, it, it, it pushes those buttons that were there anyway. No, absolutely. And, and I, think, I, I think you also illustrate a couple of the other mechanisms right. that go into religious belief. And I think that's, that's the other thing, is that, that these mechanisms that go into religious belief, there, there are a whole lot of them. Religion wouldn't be so powerful unless it utilized a lot of different cognitive adaptations. And, and the ones that you were talking about, uh, childhood credulity. Natural selection designed child brains to soak up the culture surrounding them. That had survival advantages. Uh, but a child can't tell the difference between a useful piece of information, like you know, don't swim in the river, they're alligators, from something that really isn't uh, useful in the long run. You know, if you sacrifice a goat, you'll get a good harvest. 
So there's that, childhood credulity, right? That's crucial. Also, which I think um, Pastor Phelps' son suffered from, was that we are much more vulnerable to authority than any of us would like to admit. Oh. This is the, the meaning of the St Stanley Milgram experiments. But again, it had survival advantages historically, but it makes us vulnerable to come under the sway of uh, authorities or, or people who mask themselves as authorities. Right, and it, it, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, when you explore these things, it's, it's kind of very uncomfortable for, for, for us you know, who think, who want to believe that we're in a civilized society is, well, well, how could the Nazis do these things? And how could the, the average German citizen support all these things? But I think, I think the experiments you were referring to, uh, uh, what was the name of that? Uh, Stanley Milgram at Yale. Is, is, that, is that the one where someone, with, where someone was, was the, the participant was made to believe that they were putting someone through some kind of physical Electric shock, right. Electric shock. Yeah. I don't think the person actually... No, they weren't actually, they were, they, were actors on, they were actors on the other side, but they would be screaming, and the, the person that's giving the shock thinks that they're shocking them. And they keep trying to stop, but the authority says, you right. know, keep going. They're and, totally convinced right. that the authority knows what, 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 what yeah. they're doing, you know. Uh, and, and most of them actually continue to do it. I they would they, they would continue to the to the level of what they had been told ahead of time were potentially near lethal shocks, and in, in this information age, I would encourage anybody who is, is watching the program, Google Stanley Milgram and the Milgram experiments. They're they're worth I think everybody, you know, knowing and every educated person knowing. It just helps to know just our vulnerability to authority. And if you have a chance to actually, I think I've, I've seen, I don't know if they're posted, but the actual videos of the original experiments are quite unnerving. Right. And, and the experiments have been uh, repeated, uh, so, uh, I think, a couple of years ago in San Diego. So I think, they're, I think it's something that everybody should know. Yeah, and there, there have been, I think there have been similar studies done uh, where uh, students were divided into two groups, uh, prisoners and uh, uh, jail keepers, the prison yes. guards. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a frighteningly short period of time, the people tend to forget they were acting, actually. Yeah. And that whole balance of power thing was like, I mean, it's really frightening when you think about it. You know, what we like to think of ourselves as being civilized creatures and, and how susceptible we are to that. Well, and I think there's another, uh, another part of that in, in the example you just gave which is our vulnerability to slide into us, them thinking. Yes. And that one of our weaknesses is what's called a naive groupishness, that we have a great deal of difficulty understanding groups as groups of individuals. Uh, we will, you know, lump people together quite quickly, us, them, the, the French are rude or something like that. Right. And a, a similar experiment, which is interesting, is if you take any group and, and divide them at, ran, in, at random into two different groups and give them a task to do, within a very short period of time, each group will think it's better than the other group, and, and they'll, they'll come into this us-them thinking. Uh, automatically. Yeah. Yeah, the they, other thing that uh, I think people ought to be aware of is that in our, in our minds, the out-group, when we look at an out-group, the them, the mechanisms in our mind that we use for prey animals are used to think of the outgroup. And, and so we're very vulnerable to a dehumanized view of the outgroup. Think of Martin Luther and his re reference to the Jews as worms. Um, this is a kind of thinking that we're all very vulnerable to. And as you can see, religions take advantage of that us-them thinking, the, the infidel, the unbeliever. Um, that, that can deserve death, death to apostates. Right. And, and the funny thing is that uh, both in the case of Martin Luther and I believe later with, um, or earlier with uh, Muhammad, uh, when they were starting out and vulnerable themselves, they tended to express uh, religious tolerance. They're much more religiously tolerant, but once they got into power, yes. then, then well. you know, the Jews or any other infidel was... You know, they were, it was them. You know, it was us versus them. Absolutely, and 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 the, the reality is that no religion has really survived by tolerating its competitors, and uh, you know, that's a, a something people I think need to be aware of. That, that this, uh, you know, uh, everybody's right. a brother uh, really doesn't. It hold doesn't work. It doesn't. It doesn't hold in religions and. 
there's a I, I, I have a slide of it. There's a there's a, a quote of Cardinal Ratzinger's about how Catholicism is the one true faith, and it's the only you know the only one. And uh, I think he said it as you know, as recently I think as it was 2000. And of course, he's now the current pope. Yeah, it, uh, that, that's that's. I mean, that certainly as an atheist and, and you know as a, you know hosting the show, I've come across quite often is that there's just a if you don't that whole idea of religious tolerance and you know is it works if you don't pay a lot of attention to it if you don't pay too close attention to it because if you start really thinking about it they can't all be right at the same time no somebody's got to be wrong somebody's got to be wrong and uh, um, but it, you know it's 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 amazing that that um, uh, the more tolerant your faith becomes kind of the less reason it is to kind of be there you know it's coming I mean that's true and like you say it's true with with everybody it's uh, that, that it seems somehow almost by definition group integrity relies on separating yourself from any anybody else we're atheists as opposed to believers yeah. no and, uh, and I think one cultural function of religions is to override other uh, other bonds and to override family bonds and uh, to override ethnic bonds, and it, and it creates a bigger it creates a bigger group, and and so you want group solidarity, and of course group solidarity is going to be dependent on identifying the non-members of the group, the That's out group, right. and right. and preying upon our vulnerability for us them thinking. Right, and, and so so interma religious intermarriage is frowned upon for that reason. Yeah, yeah, and and for me for me the tragedy of it is that I think if we all realized what science has shown us which is that every man and woman on this planet, all, I think it's six billion of us, right. all of us, all of us are Africans. All of yes. us are the descendants of a small band of hunter-gatherers that arose in Africa right. 70,000 years ago right. and spread throughout the world. That we truly are all brothers and sisters of you know, one small group. I, f I find that astounding. And, and I try to keep that in mind when I, you know, I'm vulnerable to it too, and I slide into some of my us, them thinking uh, some of politics. It, yeah, well, look, yeah, yeah, I mean, how much of that is, it, it, I mean, a, don't you think a certain amount of that is, is just pragmatic, you know, I mean, to get through life? Um, well, I, I don't know if it's, it, I don't know if it's pragmatic. I, I think we really want to try as best we can to avoid us, them thinking. Mm -hmm. I, I think, again, it's one of the, um, you know, one of the artifacts of the infancy of our species that may have been crucial for our survival. I mean, today, we come across more strangers in a day than our ancestors did in a lifetime. That's right. And, and, and I, I think it's an, again, it's an artifact. I mean, you have to remember that our modern skulls contain a Stone Age brain. That's right. And, and some of the legacy of that in our minds, I think we want to try really hard to be aware of. And, and resist as best we can any slide into that us them thinking. Right. Uh, um, uh, just as a side point, uh, we all we almost were not here actually. Uh, yeah. Apparently, there was a kind of a, of a evolutionary bottleneck uh, not terribly long ago, yeah. uh, right around the uh, not long after the actual uh, uh, evol evolution of mm -hmm. Homo sapiens. Uh, apparently, there should there there by rights there should be a greater genetic diversity than there is. And, yeah, I, I think it, I think you're right. And and since I, the, the show's in the New York area, the New York Times science correspondent Nicholas Wade has a wonderful paperback, which I think should be mandatory reading in every high school and college, uh, called Before the Dawn. And it is the nicest brief lucid summary of human evolution. And okay. uh, it's just that, that we got down to, uh, I think there was a, a, a climate shift about, I think, 90,000 years ago. I think they, the, the geneticists can calculate this, and right. I think we got down to about, uh, they think about 2,000 individuals, almost wiped out, uh, and then we did survive, and then obviously expanded to the current population. Uh, 2,000 individuals, that's... Yeah, 2,000... And, and people like us, modern, behaviorally modern, anatomically modern, Homo sapiens. Yeah. Um, and uh, but I, I think it's uh, just a, a wonderful book that uh, any viewer I think would enjoy.
Yeah, I, I, you know, going back to what you said before about beliefs, uh, about agency and beliefs and, and thinking of animals that, that uh, could have them, animals have minds in the sense that we have minds. I, I find that uh, when I watch uh, these nature programs dealing, say, with uh, primates, particularly gorillas and Whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation, at least not just. We are also a Jewish nation, and a Muslim nation, and a Buddhist nation, and a Hindu nation, and a nation of non-believers.